Welcome to Real News Network. I'm Mark Steiner. Great to have you all with us. You know, as Medicare for All gains traction among Democratic politicians and much of the American public, there are details that most are not attending to. There's a debate over whether Medicare for All is viable and right, as we've heard before. And there's an interesting argument being positioned, though, now about how we pay for it, where does private insurance fit in. And let me just read you these two quotes from a New York Times article that kind of set it up for us. Uh, one quote was, quote, Bill Wynn, a health care lobbyist who used to work for Senate Democrats, said, quote, the literal meaning of Medicare for all would include Medicare Advantage. But that is not what most supporters of Medicare for all have in mind. Then later in the article, uh, talking about his vision for Medicare for all and Medicare Advantage, now that fits in, Adam Green, who is a founder of Progressive Change Campaign Committee, excuse me, uh, said this, no, absolutely not. Why would it? Medicare for all in the end means fundamental systemic change. People will no longer be at the mercy of for-profit insurers that make money by denying people care. So there it is. And so this gets to the, both the fiscal and politically critical questions about who pays for health care in America, who pays for a new health care system that would be Medicare for all. How does it get paid? Does the government pay since it's a public system or is it given up to the private insurers? who can raise costs and define what kind of care we can get. Today, private plans cover more than one-third of the 60 million Medicare beneficiaries. And we are joined by Robert Polin, Distinguished Professor of Economics and Co-Director of the Political Economy Research Institute, known as Perry, at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the author of numerous books and recently co-authored the recent study, Economic Analysis of Medicare for All that shows in part that private supplemental plans are not necessary. And we're also joined by the man he credits with inspiring this study, Michael Lady, who's a public policy expert, health care for all activists, former union leader, and union activist. And Robert, Michael, welcome back to Real News. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Um, so, so let's just begin. There are two issues here, it seems to me. Um, they're very large issues. One's political and also economic. And, and, and Bob, let me start with you, because in the last interview you had with Sharmini, the two of you, the three of you, um, you made it very clear uh, about how we could begin to think about paying the costs, given the cost of healthcare in America, the trillions of dollars we pay for healthcare in America. But what about this transition then that takes place? If we have Medicare for all, the, the, the move I can see in Congress would be, well, we keep up advantage, we keep up the private insurers, that's how we're gonna get people to pay for it, all the extras they want. So, so what, what does that mean economically? Has that been analyzed at all? Uh, <clears throat> the principle behind Medicare for all is that we have one system that the insurance function is fulfilled by the government program. Um, by doing that, uh, we save a huge amount of administrative costs. Uh, we save hundreds of billions of dollars, which enables us to run a system that covers everybody with uh, good quality care and that also lowers costs. Once we re reintroduce the or enable the private insurance companies to continue and as part of Medicare for all, that is under something what we could call Medicare Advantage for all, we lose the capacity to uh, achieve savings. We uh, ad increase the administrative burdens because exactly the kinds of problems that we have now with multiple payers, uh, with, with different rules, uh, different kinds of processing claims, different kinds of requirements, for uh, seeing a doctor or seeing a specialist. So the, the basis of Medicare for All that makes it work is its administrative simplicity and overall fairness. Once you start uh, compromising on that, then you no longer have all the benefits that can be delivered to people via Medicare for All. So, so Michael Lately, I mean, one of the questions here is a political question as well, a deep political question. It's taken a lot of debate and conversation and not always very clear for many people to get to a point where many Democrats, especially the new, newly elected Democrats and the majority of the population now seem to say, I would like Medicare for all. I want my health care covered. But the politics of battling the health care industry will be as fierce, if not more fierce, under Medicare for all and saying, you're not going to wipe us out. We're going to be the ones doing this. And right now, if you're on Medicare, 
you could pay 250, 300, 350 a month extra just to get prescription plans and to get the additional coverage you need to see doctors beyond going to the hospital. So what, what, what do you yeah, think Mark, that takes us? Yeah. Well, I think, I think you laid it out exactly right. I mean, I think it takes us to the fight that we can't avoid and that a lot of the Democrats that come up with alternatives uh, to what we mean by improved Medicare for all, say, for example, a buy-in proposal or even this notion of Medicare Advantage for all, these are attempts uh, to avoid the fight because, as Bob says, you have to put the insurance function in the hands of a publicly accountable program and eliminate the profiteering, the marketing, the waste and efficiency, administrative burdens of the private insurance system. And so even advocates who say, well, like in that Robert Pear article, oh, we should go to Medicare Advantage. But they say we should heavily regulate the insurance companies as a utility. So you have a choice. You're either going to be in a fight over a regulatory regime and we see how that's worked out with the ACA, and it's been very unstable, not mm -hmm. sustainable, and in fact, um, not, not universal. And then on the alternative to that fight over regulation is a, a direct transformation of the healthcare system into one that will guarantee healthcare for all with no barriers to care. And that's the fight that we have to have, and it is a fight with the insurance industry, and not just them, but with pharmaceutical and hospital corporations as well. And Bob and the Peary study that, that he authored shows very clearly that we can transition from the current system to a Medicare for all system. We can take care of those workers in the insurance industry. We can guarantee health care for all. We can literally do everything except accommodate the insurers, which is what all these, all these alternative efforts are trying to do. So, so, Bob, the world wants to talk to you. It's very clear. That's okay. <laughs> Let's, <laughs> as they should. But, but let, let's just talk a bit about, back up a second from what Michael was just saying from the last interview you did with Shomay Perez here at Real News when you all were in Vermont together. Um, the, 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 the idea of, the, this argument is going to come up again. If Medicare for All becomes the political force that could change the nature of healthcare in America in the U.S. Congress over the next several years, the argument's going to be the only way to make it happen is for uh, medical advantage and others to be there so, so, that, so that you can pay for the parts that Medicare does not cover. So what's the argument around that? I mean, how do you push that back? The argument is that Medicare for all provides universal coverage, <clears throat> including things that aren't currently covered by Medicare, uh, such as some forms of um, dental care, uh, some forms of uh, health and wellness care, uh, all of those things get wrapped into one system, as they are in, in most other advanced economies now. So, you know, when we did our study, it's a quite extensive, uh, detailed study. But the basic points in the study are, were easy to achieve because we're basically thinking, OK, how do we emulate the best features of the system, for example, in Canada or in the UK or in France or in Germany? So uh, that's what the, the, the role of Medicare for All is, is taking the models that we have of other countries that operate fully functional healthcare systems without private health insurance, their outcomes are better. Their objective outcomes are better in terms of standard measures like infant mortality, life expectancy, and so forth. And their qualitative measures are better. That is, they measure, you know, polls of, of satisfaction of healthcare consumers in different countries are significantly better uh, on average than they are in the United States. So there, the, there's no reason to sustain the private health insurance industry. Yes, we do have to take care of the people working there, and that's why we propose a just transition program for the workers in the industry. But private health insurance is an unnecessary burden on delivering well-being to people in this country. So let's play a little game here in, in the sense of thinking about how this gets sold. Sold both to the left and progressives to understand what the heart of the issue is, and also kind of to the greater American public and to the political establishment. And, and Michael Lady, I'll start with you and we'll come back to Bob, and please feel free to jump in with each other as well. Uh, but, but so you know that if this 
is pushed hard in the U.S. Congress, Medicare for all, with this new Congress coming in, a very different mindset from many of the younger people who are now in Congress, um, that the pushback is going to be severe. And establishment forces inside the Democratic Party are not going to want to see uh, a Medicare for all the way you two are describing it at this moment. Um, so what is the politics of that, to, to push that and how that happens and how that gets organized? And what you've seen in your work as an organizer and, and with the nurses and more. I mean, so it's, to talk a bit about that, what does that strategically look like? Well, I think the big uh, picture response, Mark, is that only a mass social movement is going to have the power to overcome the huge political advantages that the healthcare industry enjoys. And so we are really talking about both an inside and an outside game. There's great work being done in the, in the House of Representatives as we speak to move toward a hearing on um, Medicare for All and a, potentially a floor vote on Medicare for All. That's a very good thing. We've got a bill in 19, 2019 for then making this a litmus test in 2020 among the Democratic candidates and then uh, elect someone uh, who will really fight for it in 2021, not just someone who pays lip service. We're at the point of time politically where we have to divide those who are going to fight for it from those who are just going to mouth it. Secondly, I think it plays out in Republican districts. You know that 52% of voters who supported President Trump, who make under $30,000 a year, support Medicare for All. Recent Gallup polling and, and, an, and another poll in the fall showed that 52% of Republicans overall supported, 70% of Democrats. The politics among voters is very good. But of course, what the industry will do is mount a fear campaign, and they've already started it. The administration started it in the fall by attacking Medicare for All as a hit on seniors. But as you were just saying, Mark, Seniors now pay potentially $250 or $300 when you combine the deduction from Social Security, the Part B plan, and the prescription drug benefit. Every month. Every month. <laughs> every month. Every month. And even if you're on Medicare Advantage, you're still paying the Part B, the deduction from Social Security, and just a little bit less. So these are real out-of-pocket expenses. By 2030, 40% of senior, uh, that is to say, um, a large majority of seniors will be looking at 40% of their income going to health care. So this is, this is the major problem. When we talk about Medicare for All, the way we win it is to say guaranteed health care with no barriers to care, financial, racial, gender, stereotype, sexual orientation, and particularly for seniors, no co-pays and deductibles, no Part B or Medicare Advantage costs, Go to any doctor, unlike in Medicare Advantage, mm -hmm. and have those benefits that Bob pointed out. The politics of this are very favorable to people. We have a labor issue because many of those unions are invested in their employer-sponsored plans. That's an issue that has to be tackled politically. The biggest threat to Medicare for All is, as you point out, the factions within the Democratic Party who are tied to the insurance industry and don't want to take on the fight. And that the only thing that can overcome that is a social movement that really forces them to do something they're not inclined to do. And that is to make transformative change in healthcare. So, so Bob Holland, uh, you know, you, in the excellent work you did in that, in the, in, in the research piece that you put out, um, that you credit Michael Lady with, with inspiring you to do. <laughs> she did. <laughs> Um, yeah, I would say. Um, I'm sure you bought it all the heavy lifting. <laughs> yes, I understand that part too. <laughs> but but so so one of the things you did in this interview I, I was watching that you all did with Charmini uh, Paris here at World News, it, it was kind of talking about the, uh, highlighting in some ways what people have to understand because people are not going to. Some of us will read the entire report because that's what we do, but most people are not going to read the entire report. And what gets them is are in kind of not simple, but in kind of very straightforward uh, what ways easily discernible to understand what this means for money, how this saves the money, and how this works. How do you perceive that happening? Well, we try to lay that out <clears throat> clearly. And yes, there's a lot of details, and I don't expect 98% of the people interested in this to read the whole report. Um, <clears throat> Number one, we try to make it really simple with respect to businesses. And we say the this, this starting point for business premiums is that every business that is now paying 
uh, premiums for health care for their workers, will see an 8% reduction in their premium on day one after Medicare for All is instituted. So if businesses are paying $100 today, when Medicare for All starts tomorrow, they will pay $92. We try to make it very simple. <clears throat> Over time, there's issues in uh, in how to actually make that functional, with because there's new businesses. Some businesses have good plans, bad plans, but we want to keep something very simple to start out. Now that covers about 60% of the additional costs that we'll need to go into Medicare for all after uh, we stop paying into the private system. Now, what about with with um, Households, households except for the top uh, one to five percent are all going to be paying less. We show that in some simple tables. If you are a uh, family that buys insurance on the private exchange, what we show is that you're going to save about 14 percent of your income uh, through the transition to Medicare for all. Um, that is your income, not health insurance costs your income effectively goes up 14% because right now you're paying 15% of income for health care and we get it down to 1%. So that's a simple thing that people are going to be able to understand. <laughs> That'll make people st stop and listen. <laughs> yeah, and, it, and it's real. Right, no, it's no it is obviously, made. yes, yes. It's not It's not made up. I saw there was, our, there was an article by this woman who's an industry... Uh, PR person who says that all of our numbers are completely nonsense. Well, they are not nonsense. And and as a check, uh, if you don't believe any of it, look, uh, the U.S. is paying 18% of GDP for health care. Uh, Canada, UK, Germany, they're paying between 9 and 11%. Even if we introduce all of the savings that we are talking about, in our Medicare for All proposal, you're still at 16% of GDP. Uh, we're not at 11% of GDP, we're at 16%. So actually, our proposal is relatively modest. But even with that, businesses save 8%, households save between 3 and 14%. That's because we run this incredibly inefficient, bloated, unfair system. And Medicare for All is the way to get out of it. Well, uh, we're about out of time. Michael, do you have a final quick thought on all this that you heard <laughs> like you, you did not get out before we had a chance to, to, before we have to end? It really isn't too good to be true. Improve <laughs> Medicare for all. Good. <laughs> <laughs> this is wonderful. I, I appreciate the two of you very much for being with us today and the work you're doing. This is really critical to our future and to what the politics of the future will be in our uh, will be in our country as well. Michael, Lady and Bob Holland, thank you so much for your time and thank your you, work. Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm Mark Steiner here for the Real News Network. Thank you all for joining us. Take care.